for, for anyone. Uh, so, uh, hello again, my name is Mariusz and I work uh, in ING for almost uh, WBA for almost a year now. Uh, I work as a data engineer for the Data Asset Squad. We are part of the uh, data analytics platform and development. And the topic of today's presentation is the, the generic ingestion framework, the, the project we, um, we started last year. Um, and it's now uh, uh, running on production. Uh, and basically all the things we learned and implemented during this phase is what, uh, what the subject of this presentation is. So we can start with answering the question, what is data analytics platform or DAP? Uh, I mentioned that the data assets part, which I'm a part of is, uh, is working on, on this product. And just in summary, uh, DAP, is a data analytics platform, which is a cloud native platform for data democratization. It's one of the products uh, uh, to create that, created to speed up the experimentation done by data scientists and, uh, mm, and analysts. It's basically developed internally uh, by ING Wholesale Banking Advanced Analytics. Uh, and its main features are the horizontal scalability, latest open source technologies and end-to-end -end security. Uh, the architecture of DAP is, uh, is very broad. We have a lot of technologies. We, uh, we are uh, having a lot of front end uh, facing services like uh, Guacamole or DAP portal internally developed by, by our uh, DAP engineering squad. Uh, there is also a Jupyter, uh, Jupyter lab environment for the data scientists and uh, Apache Superset uh, for data analysts, analysis. We also lift some on send to and provide the data discoverability functions. And we also have a, a collection of security and integration uh, tools because after all, we are a bank. So, and this is like a top priority. We, we use a lot of big data technologies revolving around data processing. So we, uh, so we have an Apache Spark cluster, the Presto cluster, um, we use Kafka mentioned before. I will deep dive some, some, something more into that in a couple of slides. And for the storage, we use a mix of AWS S3 with Hadoop HDFS. Uh, um, oh, sorry, Ceph, uh, Ceph storage with S3 interface and Hadoop HDFS and to store our data. And the mission of the data asset squad, which I am part of, is basically uh, to help data analytics platform to identify, access, and uh, secure and deliver data, regardless of its type, information, and the platform which is stored. We are the squad which is dedicated into making the process of loading data uh, into the platform as smooth as possible, as, as valuable as possible. And uh, the topic of the presentation is one of the improvements we made to the processes of uh, uh, ingesting data into the platform and uh, i'm not sure what about you but i love improving the processes it's no there is no better project for me than one that makes you to like re-examine the way something works and figure out the way to make it better uh, and to start this process the, the first step is obviously the analysis uh, so the the following slides would be like a brief summary of what what kind of we um, encountered when approaching this project. So uh, the starting point is the question of what was the current process of loading data into a platform? You cannot really say data analytics platform without data. So obviously it was in some shape or form loaded into the platform, but we had to take a closer, closer look into how it's done. Uh, and we encountered a couple of things. So. We are, we are using Apache Airflow for majority of our scheduling efforts. And uh, we noticed that the DAGs are scattered uh, across multiple repositories. So the DAGs are responsible for the for loading of the data ingestion of the data to the platform are, are not very well centralized and unified. So that means that there is not a unified approach for, for creating DAGs, but also for maintaining them. And the second part was asking uh, uh, asking a question, how do you um, onboard a new data source into the platform? And it turns out that 
and there is a copy paste approach for new data sources so uh, every time new data source is meant to be ingested into the platform onboarded into the platform it means just copy paste a repository rename a couple of variables and uh, uh, and you have yourself another data ingestion in place so this is a repetitive con uh, prone to errors uh, issue we also noticed that uh, even though most of the data ingestion processes are very similar, there are a couple of uh, those which follow the um, create new table per day uh, approach. And we somehow uh, flag this as a potential issue that uh, this happens because that means that we have excessive amount of metadata produced. Uh, the, the next one uh, we noticed is that there is no centralized metadata repository. So a couple of presentations ago, Ronald mentioned about the schema registry. And I was curious about how that works for them because uh, um, this is something we also encountered, like there is no um, way to reuse the schemas in different places if you don't have a centralized place to, to store them. They, and, and if they are just lying uh, around in Git, it's not the best uh, solution for them. And also what we've noticed that the ingestions, the ingestion process is pretty, uh, pretty uh, minimal one. So there is no like additional value created from it, except for the minimum one, which is just put the data into a platform. So we're not getting a better understanding of our data during the ingestion process, which is uh, uh, leaving a a really broad area for improvement, if you think about it um, carefully. And the last thing is more on the productivity side. So apart from the copy paste approach for the new data sources, we also, which is not very creative things for developers to do. There is also an issue of issue, a issue of uh, developers working in parallel and getting in each other way, which also leads to productivity decline in development process. But uh, uh, like we use uh, uh, OpenShift, so maybe there is some room for improvement also on this part because we have like uh, endless uh, uh, elasticity with such an environment. And, and based on those uh, those old findings, all those uh, conclusions, we we define the list of needs or requirements. Um, the areas of improvement were quite clear. So the task was to build a modern and resilient framework for uh, for the uh, to serve us to, for the years to come. And the following slide will present more or less the detailed requirements we have came up with. So the requirements were to provide a seamless data ingestion for that, which is a very nice high level uh, requirement uh, that we will deep dive in. So the desired features were that we have unified and automated process. We don't like to just copy paste, paste stuff and rely on uh, uh, manual tasks. We want to be as productive and bug free as possible. And the other, the other very strong point was for the framework to be easily extensible. So onboarding new data source to be as seamless, as fast and easy as possible, hopefully without any new coding at all. Uh, so we want, also wanted to um, simplify the metadata we, we produce. So I mentioned before that we have a lot of processes which produce a table every day. And this is what we consider to be a meta, metadata overflow. So just to give us as a brief example, we have a one data source which has 77 tables uh, updated daily, but actually it results in uh, 77 tables created daily, so it's, uh, it's thousands of uh, tables and maybe we can improve the process so, uh, so there is no metadata um, overflow anymore. We also figured that it would be cool to calculate the statistics on incoming data, so, uh, so to get the better understanding of what we have in the platform, what kind of data we load, uh, we also want to create some kind of profiling jobs for the incoming data. Uh, we also have a requirement to, to assess the quality of data. So uh, we should be aware if the quality declines or if, it's, or if it's a bad quality from the start. This is really helpful for our data scientists and engineers. Uh, so they are aware of what kind of data they, uh, they can play around with. 
And the last but not least is the productivity boost, boost during development cycle. So we also want our developers not to be frustrated by the uh, onboarding of new data sources or extending the framework in the future. And the three, three of those requirements are what we uh, consider to be a major pillars of data discoverability. So uh, the framework is not only for the data availability in the platform, but also will contribute uh, strongly into um, data discoverability, which is another step uh, um, users are taking. After being uh, aware of some data, they want to explore more and by uh, by taking these measures we want to we also want to enable greater data discoverability uh, and to achieve this all of those ambitious goals we we selected start to wor work with obviously the couple of elements of the platform are were was were already there and uh, um, and we were able to use them but uh, some of them uh, we introduced ourselves just as a, uh, as an addition required by this uh, this framework uh, so the stack we use for the generic ingestion consists of a lot of open source uh, well mainly or solely co open source components uh, we use apache airflow for scheduling uh, uh, or maybe managing our workflows we rely on spark for the data processing and then and there are a couple of Kafka components like Connect, Schema Registry, Streams, and uh, Kafka Cluster uh, mm, to facilitate all those needs. Uh, our applications are 100% uh, uh, charted with Helm. We run everything on OpenShift. Uh, and we use GitLab CI CD to the great extent uh, to automate as uh, much stuff as possible. Uh, in our development life cycle. Uh, on the data discoverability part, which is also um, embedded into our data generic ingestion, we have Apache Atlas, which is a metadata um, uh, and data governance platform, and uh, Amundsen, which is a data discoverability tool. So uh, I wanted to start with the design. So answer the question of how to put data into data analytics platform. And the high-level overview of that uh, is depicted on this uh, uh, this chart, this uh, uh, this design chart. So we uh, use the Apache Airflow to run all of our tasks, and uh, I specifically said we are not using it for scheduling, but for uh, managing our workflow because the scheduling part actually is uh, one of the creative inter integrations we made not to use the scheduler uh, in uh, Airflow at all. So we have a uh, Kafka streams and Kafka Connect applications that are triggering our DAX as soon as data is possible, as soon as uh, the data is available. Uh, we have a sch schema repository, which is Kafka schema registry to have one centralized place for our, all of our schemas. Uh, and our darks are pretty much pretty simple ones. So we just move files, acquire the schemas from schema registry, ingest and profile data. And the strength of this framework is actually in its extensibility. So it's very easy to um, add new data source uh, to it. Uh, we also rely on HDFS to store our um, tables. So this is the best performance uh, uh, currently possible in our platform and we, we're using that. And uh, with all those components, it's uh, pretty easy to have a multitude of data lakes uh, um, sending data to our platform and being easily ingested by our um, framework. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, uh, with this uh, with this uh, development or um, maybe implementation is. Uh, how we are achieving the desired extensibility, because uh, the important thing about this fragment is the extensibility of it. So, uh, because we um, we use Airflow, which really shines in in making those things possible and has a duck as a code approach, uh, we didn't want anyone to spend any time repeating code for ducks. So, no more copy pasting of ducks, no more copy paste with a new data source onboarded into the platform especially if it follows the same pattern because if it does then it's really counterproductive and uh, 
uh, not uh, ideal at all to just copy paste it. And uh, mm, there is a there is a obviously fun in writing DAGs, but only if those DAGs in writing those DAGs is uh, is a creative task and not non repetitive one. So we figure that you cannot introduce new bugs if you don't write any code. This is like another uh, benefit from this approach. Uh, if you have one code which would ideally render all of your DAGs, then uh, if you make one mistake, one mistake is easier to uh, to find it and uh, fix it, and it's not copy pasted uh, across different um, repositories. Uh, so using Airflow enabled us to, to achieve this with uh, some nifty tricks with uh, uh, Python globals and the YAM configuration. So the, to answer the question, how to upgrade the code duplication in our data ingestion processes, we decided we want to create a separate config file for every data source. So a new data source is not a new DAG, it's not a new repository, it's not a new code, it's just a new YAML file. And we developed a single function that renders uh, DAG for every every data source. So uh, this means single function re resulting in uh, a lot of uh, different DAGs. We register the DAGs dynamically using globals. Uh, so this is a, a trick with Airflow you can you can do. You don't have to write uh, DAGs, um, copy paste DAGs anymore. And what we achieved with this is that uh, onboarding new data source takes like three days. Uh, there are no repetitive code task, coding tasks because uh, we and we don't we have less bugs. We have much less error prone process, much more productive process. And uh, this is the mm, the main idea be behind the YAM configuration. So what you can see on this slide is the a uh, sample of two config files we have. Uh, actually, right now it's like mm, 11 data sources are migrated in this approach. So the config file is just a simple YAM configuration standing, stating that the given data source will be coming in the CSV format. It's delimited by tab uh, and, uh, and some values, variables for, for Spark job. We just list a number, uh, uh, names of the all the of the files which will be coming in as a part of this data source, and that's basically it. So, new data source is just create this config file, register the schemas in schema repository registry for all those files, and then you got yourself another data source onboarded. So, just uh, adding a new config to our rep repository to our DAX repository means that we have a new DAX in our Airflow. So this is the first one. You can see that four parallel um, uh, streams because of the fact that on the previous slide we had like four files in the left-hand config. And the second, second DAX is more of above 10 uh, parallel processes because there will be 10 tables ingested. And it doesn't require any coding. It's just copy paste the, or uh, maybe not copy paste, but add a new YAML configuration file. So the onboarding of the new data process now looks like that. You just re register a new config file and run a test flow on dev environment. So this is day one. Uh, if everything goes smoothly on the test uh, dev environment, then you can promote your config to acceptance environment. Acceptance environment is the first environment the, the flow will work on the actual production data. And this is like the, um, the, the process we want to run for a couple of days, for two or three days, uh, to ensure that the schemas are well suited to the production data, that the config was uh, configured defined uh, properly. Mm, and after those two or three days of running on acceptance, we just promote it to production environment. So uh, this is the flow we are following for every new data source we are onboarding into the platform. And uh, to enable this kind of elasticity, uh, we actually made a couple of integrations with Airflow, which is a great tool to, uh, to use any way you want it. So there are pretty much no limitations in 
in the approach you want to in the number of approaches you can take with it uh, so I, I in the next slides I will just um, introduce you to a couple of those integrations which are we are particularly happy with mm. none of them were very straightforward ones or maybe very obvious ones but after all they turned out to be working pretty nice so the first thing is the triggering of DAX. I mentioned before that uh, we are not relying on scheduling of our uh, airflow. All of our DAX have scheduled uh, set to none. And we have a DAX trigger application because we know that every data source relies on different schedule. We also know that delivery hours might vary a lot for consecutive days. So the first point would be easily uh, solved by just configuring the schedule for each data source but then you would get into trouble if you find out that delivery hours might vary a lot for consecutive days and this is what actually happens so for one data source it might be that today it arrived at 3 a.m but tomorrow it's 6 a.m it's very undeterministic and uh, we could use airflow uh, uh, airflow uh, to handle that um airflow sensors but if you have that that level of uncertainty that uh, it it can uh, render an unwanted result uh, so sensors often often file despite using very tolerant uh, timeouts so you would have we would have to have sensors which will be would be waiting for hours uh, for the data so we wouldn't we didn't want to go with the uh, schedule approach and we also know that Roku, which is our S3 pro security proxy layer, sends an AWS S3 event to Kafka when files appear on set. So maybe we can somehow leverage the, this kind of streaming information to have more elastic way to trigger our DAX. And what we found out we can do about it is not to spawn DAX regardless whether data is available on set or not. And this is what happened before, like every day at 6 a.m. regardless of the data availability on our storage layer the DAX were spawned and we didn't want to do it anymore we thought that we would react on AWS S3 events provided by Roku and uh, use the streaming approach to trigger our DAX and we uh, use Airflow REST API to trigger DAX. So um, this is how we integrate between streaming application in, and Airflow. And this is the, um, the detailed uh, design of what we are actually doing. So you can see in the chart that we have four incoming files, which are, let's say, the first data source uh, config, uh, which I shown. Uh, required for data fi for files to be available for the data source so imagine all of those four appear on our roku um roku kafka topic so it means it's already available in s3 in our set and we have um, we have two applications one of them is the kafka streaming application and another one is kafka connect so i'm really glad that ronald already mentioned this technology because it just proves how uh, how good of the data engineering tool it is so we have a file listener and if it's, it is a kafka streams application which is uh, which just set, waits for a set of files with the same date so we have some kind of regex um, configuration that says if those four files are, are available for the same date then uh, let's do something about it and it publishes an event once all of the required files are on S3. So this is a stateful application, uh, which then is tied together with Airflow Sync Connector. And this is in turn an application which uses a Kafka, which is a Kafka Connect Sync Connector, reading a triggering event from file listener and makes a REST API call to data to trigger DAX. And this is actually open source uh, uh, by by our colleague on on github so you can use it on your own if you want it's basically a sync connector that can uh, read uh, events on a kafka topic and then send them to and then trigger dax based on that the other integration we made was with uh, with gitlab so what we know is that projects consist of many developers working in parallel 
and nobody likes cold conflict. So ideally, everyone works uh, on the separate branch because that's uh, that's uh, that's how you avoid those cold conflicts. And the developers don't want to be bothered with every environment setup. So we have Airflow running on OpenShift, and we have a OpenShift, a lot of OpenShift namespaces to use. So maybe we can somehow use GitLab and OpenShift to solve the issue of like clashes between developers. Uh, and because we can spawn containers in OpenShift, this is the solution we came up with. So we have a CLI utility which is called Demander, and it's a, a utility that spawns Airflow on demand instances. And it's integrated with our C GitLab CI CD uh, and environment functionality. So what you can see is that every time developer creates a new feature branch on GitLab, uh, there, is, there is an additional step in the um, CI CD pipeline, which is called start Airflow. And it actually registered registers a new Airflow instance um, in our uh, in our OpenShift, which is available just for this developer, just for his feature branch. So developers just push code to new new branch in GitLab. Uh, the Airflow on demand install, uh, instance is installed and reg registers a new environment in our GitLab CI/CD. Uh, and developers can easily push code to the to the feature branch they they are using, and it's automatically synced with GitLab sync to uh, to his own Airflow instance. And after he developer merges the code to master, the Airflow goes uh, goes down and it's deleted from uh, OpenShift. So you can see from this screen we have like this screen depicts that, that we have three separate feature branches on OpenShift uh, on GitLab. Sorry which results in three separate instances of Airflow um, in OpenShift. And each of those instances is tied to a separate uh, GitLab uh, Git branch. So no more clashes between developers. And it's spawned automatically, so uh, developers don't have to worry at all about uh, installing, uh, setting up and down the, the environments. Uh, and every of those instances gets unique instance identifier, so there won't be any clashes between users using the same uh, same uh, namespace or URL for for the Airflow. And from the user's perspective, so what are the benefits of uh, what we have implemented in the last uh, months? And this is the the design of how the data is actually. Mm, accessed by our users after we have introduced the generic ingestion uh, framework. So after the generic ingestion pipeline has completed, uh, we have uh, new data tables on Hive, in Hive, uh, stored on HDFS. We have a new set of metadata like columns, statistics, uh, tables, descriptions, uh, table properties, and stuff like that available in Atlas. And when new when users come to DAP to to access this data, to explore this data, they have four uh, four like endpoints to use. They can use Amundsen send to provide to have a data discoverability function, so they can easily find what kind of data is available into the on the platform. They can use a DAS in the box, which is our product, um, which is basically a Jupyter Lab um, environment dedicated to each user, separate instance for each user. They can use a Presto cluster to query our data uh, or a superset to create some uh, dashboards. So the benefit in that is that we have unified approach on creating all the data and metadata. There is a process of metadata enrichment, so we calculate column, uh, column statistics uh, and uh, provide them to users through uh, data discovery tool. Uh, and all, all of our users can query the data easily with all of the mentioned endpoints. And we are not done yet. So there are still a couple of things we want to do with our framework. It's still not a um, closed project. So uh, we want to have some kind of notifications on the, on the events um, from the generic ingestion. So every time, for example, we notice the qual data quality uh, is uh, declining, we want our users to be notified about this, stuff like that. 
we are working also on uh, better handling for table description and metadata propagation across all the um, ingestion processes. And uh, I already mentioned data quality. This was our requirement, but it's not uh, implemented yet. So this is like another another step in our pipeline to enable some kind of data quality uh, assessment during the ingestion process. So as soon as the data is loaded into the platform, we are also aware of, of its condition. And that concludes my presentation um, and leaves some space for the questions, if you have any. Um, not sure if you do. Yes, there is a question. Multiple. Um, the first question is, are multiple record types per file uh, uh, supported to be loaded? Um, so we look at this at, uh, from different angles. For right now, um, every data source has the same, let's say, structure. So if you have data source, for example, you know, I said ING, all of the files in this data source follow the same um, follow the same structure that all of them are either CSV or Parquet files delimited by um, the same delimiter. But uh, just recently we have introduced the possibility to define if the data is coming by either uh, um, some kind of increments or whether the new new file consists of the full refresh snapshot of the data. So um, we are working on enabling the configuration side more on the um, file file side, not on the um, data source type, because it might be the case in the future that it's even more granular. Yeah. And you do kind of support it already with Swift and things like that, where it's more like a the, the data structure itself is like kind of like JSON. So you can have different uh, formats as just different JSONs as different records. The thing we don't support and probably wouldn't want to support is like different CSV structures in a single file or something horrible. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So every file needs to follow some kind of schema, which we uh, define in schema registry and then validate if these files uh, follow that schema. Thanks for the answer. Uh, so the, the other question is, do you capture operational uh, lineage in your data flows? So that's that's a yes. Mm, uh, all of our components we are which we are using, uh, or most of them which are required for this, support the, um, the lineage uh, with uh, the use of Atlas. So we uh, we have uh, we are using Hive hook for capturing the changes in the in the data in Hive, and we are using Spark Atlas connector to um, to capture any transformations on data. So the result of this this data flows is that uh, if you get a new partition in uh, in uh, Atlas, for example, new entity and partition uh, in Atlas, then you can track easily uh, all the flow. How did the data get into this point? So so yes. You're welcome. So if there are no more, uh, there is another. Oh, no, there is one. And, and it plans to integrate with Open Data Nigeria. <laughs> That's a good question. And uh, yes, we have it uh, in our side that it would be very valuable to, to integrate it. It's uh, Mm, it obviously would be a challenge uh, uh, a challenge to integrate but uh, the end goal is that our data discoverability tool has is aware of all the data we have in ing so also Nigeria All right, so if there are no more questions, then I guess uh, handing over back to Sam. Thank you, Marius, it was, it was super good. And um, I really want to thank you all again for attending and for the amazing presentation um, from Ronald, Marcus and Marius. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm going to give the 
the word to our HR manager, Stanley. Yes, <clears throat> hi guys. Um, is my camera on? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Stanley. I work at uh, WBA uh, as, a, as a recruiter and I do HR. Um, basically the second coolest job in the team. Of course, the coolest job is to work as an engineer. Um, unfortunately, um, ever when I was younger, I noticed that I, I really sucked at math and all the other uh, uh, beta languages. So um, yeah, that's the second best thing that I could do is work with engineers uh, and, and try to find them. And, and, and that's basically what I've been doing um, all my working life, um, which sounds a little bit sad maybe, uh, but it's actually a cool job. So uh, I work for WBA. Um, we're recruiting uh, for data engineers, uh, full stack developers, uh, not just in Amsterdam, but also uh, building uh, fairly big new teams in Warsaw. Um, so basically the teams um, where Marius and, and, and Ronald were, were talking about this afternoon, uh, for, for those teams, we are looking for, for great engineers. Uh, I will share some, some links in the chat um, uh, when I finished uh, um, uh, talking. Um, so if you have any questions about joining our team, or if you would like to, to join our team to be able to present something cool uh, during our next events, uh, let me know. And um, yeah, hope to see you soon then. So we're looking for, again, data engineers, full stack developers, back end developers, front end developers in Warsaw, in Amsterdam, uh, London, and Romania. And uh, uh, well, the, the, you, you've seen the stack that we're working on earlier on in the, uh, in the presentations. But just uh, a little recap if you're able to develop in Scala or in Java, uh, Python, if you know Spark, if you love to work with Flink, with Kubernetes, with Docker, please let me know, guys. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation today. And uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Stanley Wakkeri. I will also post that on the chat. And um, then 